Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, participating in tonight's class. Uh, my name is Zach Roberts. I'm the conservation coordinator here at Hoover Basin Water. Um, tonight, we are going to be talking about spring perennials. So those are the flowers that we, and the plants that usually flower in the spring. So we're going to have some fun talking about this. Um, before we get started, this is Dave Rice. Uh, he is my supervisor. Um, if you have any questions for either of us, feel free to, to find us after. I think Dave may skip out a little early, go visit his family. That's not so fun. It, it just depends on how interesting I am. <laughs> right? Um, okay, so a little bit about myself. I um, have been in the industry working with landscapes and maintaining landscapes for about 16 years. Uh, so I know this material uh, fairly well, um, and it's something that I am really excited about. Dave and I were uh, self-declared plant nerds, so when it comes to plants and flowers, uh, we get really excited to talk about those things. Um, how many of you have been to a class here before? Okay, that's that's great. How many of you is this is your first time? How many of you is this your first time ever being here to this facility? Okay, awesome. Um, well, what we'd like to do is just uh, talk to you a little bit. Maybe. There we go. Let's, uh, so just as an introduction, we want to talk to you about um, the Weaver Basin, what it is, um, and what we do. So here at Weaver Basin Water Conservancy District, we um, this is our geographic area. We take in Weaver County, Davis County, Summit County, Morgan County, um, and there's one more. Am I missing one? Davis, we've been working inside. Yeah, and then there's just a little sliver of Box Elder, but just around Fuller Bay. Um, so, here are some statistics about the, the Conservancy District and um, five counties, 2,500 square miles. There's a lot of people that live in this area. Well, there's seven dams, that means that there's seven reservoirs that. Uh, are supplying water to those residents. There's three power plants. Anyway, um, we are a regional water provider, and as part of that, we are entrusted to make sure that there is water available to all of the residents within our boundaries uh, in our service area. And um, as populations grow, it's our responsibility to make sure that that water supply stretches to meet that growth. And so um, as part of the conservation department, um, Dave and I, we work to develop programs and uh, educate the public on how we can uh, use water more efficiently so that we can have more water available for more use and more efficient. All right. so. Three types of plants. Um, there are annuals, which are have a life cycle of one year, but they will uh, germinate, they'll live, and then they die. That all in one year. There are biannuals that typically have a lifespan of two years, and then there are perennials. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Perennials come back multiple years, um, and there are such things as long-term perennials and short-term perennials. So some plants are longer lived than others. And uh, we were talking about, I gave a presentation earlier today, we are talking about um, agave plants uh, because they're really hardy. Well, we have them that are a hardy variety. They're typically grown in, in warmer climates, but we have a hardy variety here. As soon as that plant flowers, it dies. So. Um, agave is a long living plant, but uh, in terms of its lifespan, it will 
die after a while. Anyway, most of the plants that we talk about are going to be longer lived plants. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and let me know. We'll try to I'll try to answer those questions um, as best as I can. Um, when you are choosing, you're at the nursery, you're wanting to buy plants, because that's what we do is we go to nurseries and we want to buy plants. And it doesn't matter um, how many plants you have, you always need more, right? Um, so when we are choosing perennials, what we want to do is look at the plants you have in your yard and see how well this plant is going to coordinate with your other plants. So it's good to have a good idea of what you're going to look for. Um, so if you have plants in your yard already that have larger leaves, then maybe you look for a plant that has some finer leaves to get that contrast. Um, if you have a yellow flower, then maybe you don't want to put a white flower next to it, or you have a purple flower, maybe, you know, coordinate those colors. Um, if you have a flower that has a big blossom on it, then maybe you want another big blossom plant next to it. Uh, so just go in with an idea of what you have and have a good idea of what you want to get. And when you are at the nursery looking for perennials, always check for insects because um, you don't want to bring home those, well, diseases and those insects to your garden. Um, nurseries have, uh, they, they go through and they try to spray and um, keep the insects in check, but it's sometimes it's just really difficult. We can bring new plants in from uh, a wholesaler and, and have an outbreak. Also, it's good to know what your hardiness zone is. Here in this area of Utah, we are in about a zone five. Um, that means that um, if you look on the USDA hardiness zone map, um, it will tell you what our average low temperature is. And that's how they determine what types of plants will live in our area. Um, some plants can't handle cold weather, other plants can. Uh, there is a, an alternative um, zone map which is a maximum temperature. Um, so sometimes you'll see like on a website or something, they'll have your minimum temperature zone and your maximum temperature zone. Um, when you are looking at your plants, always look at the plant tax. There's a lot of information, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but there's a lot of information on those tags. Uh, it'll tell you light requirements, water requirements, um, how big the plant will hit. Usually, if you're a plant nerd like me, you can learn the botanical name of the plant also. And um, also, something to consider is staggering bloom times so that you always have color in your landscape. Okay, so we're going to talk about these things here. These are just some examples of insects to be on the lookout for uh, and diseases. Um, there at the, the top, I guess top left, as you're looking at it, that is uh, spider mites. Spider mites are detrimental to plants. They are little spiders and they're almost microscopic. You can see them, um, but they're, they're hard to see sometimes. Um, they will suck the life out of the leaves. Um, that's what they do. Okay. So be on the lookout for those. They typically will have a little um, web around them there, and um, you may be able to see that. If you see your leaf starting to curl or it starts to look kind of grayish like that, um, like that there, you may be able to take a leaf and hold a piece of paper underneath that and shake it, and then watch the little red spots move around on your paper. Okay, so that's how you look for spider mites. Spider mites are uh, a pest for a lot of different plants, and so uh, trees, shrubs, uh, that's a good way to, to check. Just take a piece of paper with you. 
Um, okay, so others, the leaf below the, the fire mites is thrips. Thrips are, you'll have these little white spots on the leaves, um, like this and that. And then this yellow arrow is actually pointing to that rib. Okay. Um, this larger picture here is a rose bud that has aphids on it. Okay. Um, it also has a beneficial insect on it, um, and um, which is a lace weed. But a uh, really kind of fun fact about aphids is that um, ants will farm the, the aphids. They will pick them up, move them to another place on the plant, and then the aphid will uh, start eating the, the juices out of the plant. And um, as they process the food, they have to uh, go to the bathroom. And uh, it's really sugary. And so the ants will take that um, waste and use it as a food supply. So uh, if you see aphids on rows uh, or really any plant, look for ants because they may be um, farming. That's really the best way to describe it. They will be farming those, those aphids. Okay. Um, other things you want to look out for, um, scale insects. Uh, and if it looks dead or dying, then it's probably not a good plant to, to bring home, unless you're a plant whisperer and you want a challenge. All right, so uh, again, this is your USDA hardiness zone map. Um, and you can see we're kind of in the blue there, uh, stone white green, uh, depending on where you live. If you live up on the bench here in Utah, then it may be a closer to a four than to a five, but most of Utah is in that green, um, green zone, which is about five. Okay. That's a question. Oh, yes. Can you plant a plant? We're in zone five. Can you plant a plant that's in zone four? Yes. And get it in the loop without a lot of trouble? Yes. So you, it's a lot easier to go down in temperature than it is to go up in temperature. So a plant that is a zone four or three or two is adapted to a colder climate and they're going to do fine here. Yeah. The, uh, the plants that are a seven, eight, nine, nine is like right on the equator. You're living in Hawaii kind of plant. Um, and they won't do, do well. Uh, unless you have it as a house plant and it's inside all the time. Um, okay, reading the plant tag. Here's a couple of examples of some plant tags. So you have the information on there. You have uh, the name of the plant itself, usually right here, and then the variety name or the cultivar name. And then, so this is a perennial. It's, there's it. Latin name or botanical name, uh, a picture of what it looks like, and then um, on the back, you usually have information about how big it gets, the plant will get, how um, spacey the plant is, uh, what zone it is. Uh, sometimes they'll even put companion plants, or if this plant goes well with this other plant. Uh, I've only seen that uh, a number of times, not too common, but I have seen it. Um, and then, of course, it has this other tag has is a full time perennial, and usually they'll have kind of the water requirements also. Because when you're planning out your your garden, your landscape, you want to group plants that have the same water requirements together and then water them the same way, uh, and then go over to a, a different area and, and group other plants uh, that have the same water requirements and, and water them the same way. Yes? Okay, so the QR code will go to the website of this man or this uh, plant provider, wholesaler. Um, and it'll give you a little bit more in-depth information about that. Yeah, that's a great question. 
Yes. What is full sun, part shade, part sun? That is a great question. So um, you typically have four different um, light requirements or light requirement categories. There's full sun, which means it gets more than six hours of sun in a day. Then you have part sun, which means it gets up to six hours of sun, and it's usually um, in the morning. And then part shade is up to six hours, and it's usually shady at, let's see, it would be shady in the morning, light at night, and then full shade, which means it doesn't get very much sun at all. All right, so we have um, a lot of different types of plants that we can use in our yards. And it's always nice to have color throughout the whole year. Um, so what you want to do is um, have plants that are going to bring the interest to your yard all year round. And so we're gonna talk about three perennials today. We have two other classes that we will be offering later this year. Um, one during the summer to talk about those plants that are summer perennials, and then one in the fall to we'll talk about fall perennials. Okay, here are some good resources. If you are um, interested in learning a little bit more about common ornamental pests, uh, go to the extension website. Down here on the bottom is uh, extension.usu.edu slash pest. Um, and this is actually a book that USU has published and has pictures and a, a, a lot of common ornamental pests. There's one for gardens, there's one for trees, there's uh, a few of these books. But um, this is a good resource to help you identify what those pests are. And then it'll have tips and tricks on how to uh, control those pests. Um, another publication that I saw on the extension website is uh, this. This is actually a two page or a three page paper. Um, and it is Landscaping for Season Long Color, uh, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, this will give you good information on trees and shrubs and flowers, ground covers that are adapted to Utah that we can use in our landscape. This is a great resource. Okay. Um, I would be um, remiss if I didn't talk about bulbs. Um, bulbs are the first plants that come up in the spring and nothing shouts spring quite uh, as well as bulbs. So we're gonna talk about three different types of bulbs. This is a hyacinth. A hyacinth is a, um, I mean, you can see these, this is out of a, a bulb catalog. I used to buy bulbs from, from this company. Um, I used to buy a lot of bulbs from this company. But uh, they bulbs, these hives have come in a lot of different colors, um, more in the reds and pinks than to the purples and blues. Um, that orange one on the top right is um, fairly new uh, and not as common as, as uh, the other colors. They are about six to 10 inches tall. They spread to be about four to six. Each bulb is going to produce uh, one, maybe two flowers, um, and but typically it's just one flower. Um, Hyacinths are some of the earliest bulbs to flower in the spring. So uh, super fragrant. If I, I would always plant these um, right on the door, or walk up to my front door. I just love the smell. They are just, and it's almost an overwhelming scent. If you get a nice big group of them together, there's nothing better. Um, they do take a little bit of water um, to get established. You can plant these in the fall, um, and then 
they will come up in the spring. And they do require a little bit of water, but um, usually the water that's in the ground for spring is enough, you know, so the, the snow melt and, and runoff is usually enough to keep these alive until they're done. Um, when the flower starts to shrivel, it will lose its petals and you'll be left with the flower stalk. Um, best management practice is to cut that flower stalk down at the base of the leaves and then let the leaves grow and um, put energy back into the bulb. And then you, as soon as those leaves start to dry out and die out, then you can remove those leaves. Yes? So if you plant them in containers, you will need to water them too. I would water them if you're planting them in a pot. Um, yeah, absolutely. I would, I would water those. Yeah. Yes? So if we can't see what you said used to get them from this catalog, what catalog is it? So if you look at the bottom there, it's the ADR Bowl Company. They are a wholesaler, so uh, you have to buy them by the thousands um, to for them to sell them to you. But they do supply to some of the local nurseries around here, and uh, you can get them at your local nursery. Yes. What kind of process is it to bloom? Um, okay, so if you want to get a flower to bloom um, in a pot in the spring. What you'll need to do is call, it's called fertilization. Um, they have to go through about a month of cold temperatures. Um, so you might be able to forth that bowl uh, if you were to put it, I wouldn't put it outside um, because of the frost, the frost will kill the bowl, but um, you can put them in your refrigerator and then take them out after a month Put them in the ground and they will start to the sprout. Yeah, it's a that's a, a horticultural trick. Uh, yes, so there's a bean bolts. A lot of these you find in the fall because they're meant to be planted in the fall for that cold period. Yes, bloom in the spring. So you might have a difficult finding bolts right now because yeah. they're usually sold in the fall, but planted in the fall, and then you get this nice early color at the end of the Yeah. But of course, you can force them. You'll see them in stores. You can look at that field, you know, because they force them and they need the flowers not all the time. Yeah. But just so you know, if you're trying to find them now, it's going to be harder to find them. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so you can plow them somewhere? Can you then plant them? Yes. If, if you can find the flower and it's blooming and it still has the bulb on it, you can take it home and plant it and it would be, it would survive. You would probably get um, a shorter bloom time on it because of warmer temperature, um, but it, you should be, yeah, you should be okay to but put it in the ground and it will do well. Yes? How late in the fall, winter, can you plant it? You can plant bulbs um, until the ground freezes. Um, so um, if you were to come across bulbs in the late spring, where temperatures are starting to get warm and you're not wanting to hold on to them until the fall to be able to plant them, the best place to store a bulb is in the ground. So um, as soon as you get a bulb, take it home and plant it. Yeah. How do you know how to plant them? So kind of the rule of thumb for planting is you look at the, the diameter of the bulb and the bulb diameter, um, for a tulip, you probably want to plant it six to eight inches. The bigger the bulb, the deeper you want to plant it. So hyacinth, it uh, has a pretty decent sized bulb. Six to eight inches is probably a good size for that. There's another flower that's called fritillaria. It has a, a really big bulb and you can plant that a little deeper. Um, Oliums are another bulb that you can plant and they will, they will be deeper. It looks like a big onion. The, the bulbs. Okay, daffodils. Uh, another early spring bloomer. There are some that bloom earlier. There are some that bloom a little later in the season. Um, but one of the earliest to come up in the spring. Daffodils. They get to be about six to twelve inches tall. Um, the spread on them is about four to six inches. 
the, the flower stalk on them. Once the, the flower dies, you can just clip off the, the head of the daffodil, leave the flower stalk. Because it's green, it means that it's photosynthesizing and it will help to recharge that, that bulb. Um, typically, you find these in whites or yellows or oranges, and they need a uh, full sun. Sometimes you can get away with a part shade, but uh, more so with a full sun. And they're a, a medium water user, also. Can I ask a question? Yes. Splitting them. Splitting them. Do you know how the daffodils advance from not produce flowers? Uh -huh. And by then, it's too late to split them? Um, yes, typically. Um, if, if you're perennializing your bulbs uh, and they stop to produce, they stop producing flowers, then typically the, the size of the bulb is too small to support that, um, that bar. So it, it would be good to separate them, but you, as you're, you're growing them, you'll want to really fertilize them and get them to a point where they're putting a lot of energy into the bulb. So um, is there like a rule of thumb like split it every three years or split it every couple of years? I just pay attention to how many flowers, how many flowers you're getting and once you see a decline, you're like, okay, I need to go in it and start to separate those. Now, I've had, in, in a landscape, I've had um, daffodils that have bloomed for probably about eight years and I haven't seen any sign of that flowering increase. Might have been in the for three years. Oh, there you go. So, yeah, you may run into it. But the best thing to do is to, as soon as the flower dies, you, you want to inhibit that seed production. So you'll cut the, the flower head off so that the energy goes back into making that bowl larger and being able to store energy in the bowl. Okay, tulips. Uh, tulips is, if there's any flower that says spring, it is a tulip. Um, and there are a lot of different varieties of tulips. There's tulips that are super early. There's tulips that come on later in the season. Um, you can get tulips that are short. You can get tulips that are tall. There are some varieties that are signatures and then others that are two feet plus. Um, they're about six to eight, six to 10 inch spread. Early spring, um, I'm sorry that this is a little hard to read. Uh, a lot of different varieties of colors, the whites, pinks, reds, orange, purples, there's multicolored, there are fringe, petals, tulips that are really neat. You can see some of those in this picture. Um, and they don't require a lot of water after they start to, to grow and come out in the spring. They do require a little bit of water in fall to get established. And that's that's probably the most important time to water your bulb is in the fall. Make sure that they um, get nice and established in the fall. A couple of really good varieties that do well here are the Darwin hybrids and the Triumphs. They're excellent series in this area. Exactly. And it's just, it's, a lot of these bulbs when you plant them in the fall. Match, we get natural precipitation, so most of the time you don't have to water them because nature will water them. Yes. So if you plant them and they have a dry fall, then you'd want to get some water. Yeah. So they can get established and settled in. Good thing. But yeah. Most of the time in October, we find people, we get, we get a decent amount of rain or something, and it, it does it for you. Yep. If you are interested in bulbs, we are teaching another class just about bulbs. So um, we'll we'll go through all of that in that class. Yes. Are there any tulips that deer now? Uh, that is a good question. Tulips are deer candy. They are the deer will go out of their way to eat your tulips if you have tulips. But the daffodils and the hyacinths, the deer stay away from them. And so if you are having troubles with deer eating your tulips, maybe consider switching to a daffodil or a tulip. There's also another flower, I, I mentioned it before, fritillaria. It smells like a skunk. Um, and uh, it's a really cool looking flower, but um, 
it does not, even the bulb itself does not smell good. It's kind of an interesting, interesting smell. Do you have any questions to answer? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so this is Digitalis uh, or a box one. Um, it's a dome four to eight, so it will um, withstand cold temperatures, uh, cooler than we normally see here. Um, gets to be about two to five feet tall, spread is about one to two and a half feet. Um, good bloom time from May to June. So this is a, a late spring bloomer. Um, some good quality color, um, some pastels, and full to sun, full sun to part shade, and these a uh, medium about amount of water. Um, it could probably go a little bit more on the drier side with this one. Um, you want to be careful with this plant in particular because it is poisonous, and so you don't want to plant this around kids who like to eat flowers. You deer like them? I don't know if deer like them or not. I don't know, did uh, any of you read that story about the deer that had started to come down off the mountains and they got into the ewes? And started foraging on ewes. Well, ewes are toxic also. And anyway, it's just kind of the same thing. Be careful, be mindful about these things as you're planting them um, so that you can keep your animals away from them um, if they're if they like to eat plants, then you'll want to maybe skip this one. Um, okay, so this is a lupine. And lupines are uh, an alpine plant, but they do really well in uh, our area for the spring. And, and so they'll come up, they have varieties that will flower throughout the summer, uh, but if you can get these, they're, they are bulb also, but um, really kind of interesting. You can see all of the different colors there. So there's all of the information. Um, three to four feet tall, one to five feet wide. Like I said, an early to late spring bloom and a lot of varieties of color. Uh, these are peonies. Um, peonies are peonies are not my favorite plant because they are really showy for a week. That's that's all of the flowers that you get is for a week. I think that most people like them. I'm going to say most women like them because they tend to bloom right around Mother's Day. And so um, they are really striking. The, the blossom on them is, is really very pretty. The Just the drawback to these is that they are only, they're a very short flower and then you're left with the, the foliage and so um, they're enjoyable for about a week. Okay, here's the information on that. Um, two to four feet tall. There are some varieties that are um, more woody and some varieties that are more herbaceous um, and there is one family of peony that has um, been hybridized, and that's the Ito peonies. Um, he was successful in hybridizing the herbaceous with the woody plant. And uh, so, if you're looking for a good, uh, a good variety of, of peony, uh, then the Ito is that series is a, is a great kind of gets the best of both worlds with that. Um, I was told by by someone that um, you can tell someone who is from Utah because they will say peony, and if you live outside of Utah, it's a peony. So um, pay attention to those you're talking to. Say, hey, have you ever seen my peonies? And they're like, it's a peony. Like, uh, I just, I just a peony. Okay, well. There you have it. But a lot of people say the kidneys as well. Yeah. They're wrong, but that's what they say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, this is uh, Delphidium. 
Daphiniums are um, pulsed white flower, um, or I guess a conglomerate of flowers. They are really kind of striking. This is one of the flowers that you can really get a, a pretty true blue, and one of the only flowers. Blue is not a naturally occurring color um, with plants. And so um, some of these delphiniums have been hybridized and bred to have that really deep blue color. Um, also called a, a large spur, zone you know, three to seven, blooms uh, kind of later in the year, uh, later in the spring, May to June, um, blues and white, some purples, some reds, but uh, full time to part shade. I've grown these in almost full shade also, and they've done it. These are pessimists, and I apologize. Some of these pictures are, they work on my computer, but aren't working here. And, must just have a, a corrupt file, but uh, pensamins are native to Utah, um, and they are. If if Utah were to rethink about their flower, uh, the state flower, this would be probably the best candidate. They are found everywhere in Utah, and they grow really well, very tolerant. They are really showy. As soon as they start to flower, it's Pretty much that whole season. Um, so mid spring bloom to mid summer, a um, lot of reds, yellows, pinks, uh, white, as you can see, and they are a really great drought tolerant flower. We have uh, quite a few varieties here. There are so many different varieties of penstemon that you can you can find here in Utah and in the nurseries. Question are there any, yeah. are there any that grow in the shade? Uh, not typically, no. They they do better in the, the heat, so in the in the sun and, and enjoy that. Yes. So do they spread? They are a little bit more bunching. Um, they can seed in other places. Yeah. Really good for pollinators. So your bees and hummingbirds. Okay, basket of gold. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, it is uh, no three to nine. It can grow, it's a lower growing plant, six inches to one foot, um, but it can spread to be about double its height. Uh, it blooms in April and goes to about June. The, the flowers on it are really bright yellow, as you can see. And also loves full sun. And uh, you probably see these more in a, in a dry landscape, uh, more of a water wise garden. Um, but they're really great, they're really uh, impressive bloom. And, and when it blooms, it's, it's like the whole outside of that plant is, is just covered in, in eco colored flowers. Really awesome. Um, it's a great one. Okay, Western blue flax. This is another um, just great early color, but it's going to be a sustained color throughout the whole spring. Um, kind of a taller plant, has these blue flowers on it, and it spreads to be about a foot and a half wide. So if you were to plant multiples of these, it's a really good um, plant to, to have in a mass. Um, loves full sun, and again, it's, it's just a nice, dry, uh, drought tolerant plant. Uh, Sun dancer daisy. These are really fun because um, they're always in this. There's almost a constant state of stages of blooming. So there are some flowers that will be just coming up whilst other flowers on the plant, same plant are open and blooming. And then uh, as they, it's, it's always just kind of rejuvenating and going through that cycle of, of flowering. So uh, good year, almost growing season, wide plant. It'll bloom from April to September, 
it does not need any water. Um, maybe to get established, but then you can back it up to almost nothing. Um, they only have it in, in yellow at the moment. And so this one is, is fairly uh, native to Utah also. Okay, catmint. Uh, I am, again, this is almost like um, the, the peonies. I am not a fan of catmint, but it grows here and it grows really well here. So I was, uh, I needed to put it in because it, it is a fairly attractive plant. Um, if you're not careful, it can get away from you. And uh, especially the, the naturally occurring varieties of catmint, it has a, a rhizome that goes and just uh, goes under the soil and it will just spread and spread and spread until all you have is catnip. Um, there are some uh, cultivated varieties that don't spread as much, but it is a, it's a really attractive flower. Um, usually it's a, a light purple, can be fairly tall, one to two and a half feet tall, and it can spread to be about three feet. Um, but it can if you're not careful with okay. Is that yeah. why you don't like it? It is one reason why I don't like it. Also, uh, cats really do like it, and I don't care much for cats in my yard. So, um, so that's that's my take on cat. Um, other people may really like catnip, and that's that's great. Um, it is in the mint family, so um, if you crush the leaf, it has a very distinctive smell. All right, uh, Helleborus. This is a lower growing um, perennial. It has this pink flower on it. Usually four, going four to nine. Um, they will bloom in April and pink to rose purple. Some uh, the flowers will have the, the yellow stamen in the in the middle of the petals. Um, it likes full sun and it doesn't mind uh, going a little while without water. Yes. So it only blooms in April. It will bloom. It, that's when it starts to. Yeah. So how so long? Um, I would say pretty short bloom, um, but uh, it is almost like a PD. It will it's worth it to, to have it. It's just a really nice, uh, striking flush of color. This one you might get a little snow on it, but don't worry about it. You know how sometimes you get a late spring snow. This sometimes bloom, and then you get a little snow. But yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, ground covers. There's one in particular that is uh, a good spring blooming ground cover, and it is the Turkish Veronica. Um, Turkish Veronica is a low growing, almost carpet type ground cover. It has this blue flower on it. Um, if you have a dry, spring bed or dry waterfall or even rocks in your yard this is a good plant if you have like a rock boulder retaining wall this is a good plant to plant around those boulders because in the spring when it is in bloom it almost looks like water um, flowing through your your rocks or over your rocks and it's just really kind of a design thing that you can um, I don't know, kind of forced that your imagination to, to be about. Yes. So you can, um, it's best to dig it up with a shovel and try to get as much of the root as possible. And then you just put it where you want it. Maybe put some soil up around to keep that root ball. Um, from drying out, and that's probably the, the best way to, to transplant that. Is it like a root center? Uh -huh. Yeah, 
Yeah, so yeah, really, if you were to go here and um, in an area where you may not border or you're really thick in that area, you can go in and just cut it almost like you would saw. You would just go in and cut it, make sure you get um, a good maybe six inches of soil, and then you can put that right in place. Uh, sometimes you may need to dig a little depression in where you're going to put it to, to accommodate that root and then uh, just put some soil around it and, and give it some water. Yeah. Does it does it die back and you have to trim off the flowers or does it look okay when it? No, it, it doesn't need to be dead at all. Um, you can let it go. The flowers will become insignificant when it's not in bloom and then it's just a, a green carpet. You, it is uh, fairly steppable, so you can put it down as a, a walkable uh, ground cover. Um, I would avoid putting it where there's heavy foot traffic, but uh, in a, an application like this where you're going to be stepping on the stones more than on the plant, uh, that's a, a really good application for it. Yes? If you wanted to use that to like fill the pool, no, it's it's not going to climb up. It may cascade over or something, but it's not going to climb up and choke um, your plants. But it will fill in around the base of your plants. Um, so a really good ground cover, good way to keep weeds out from around your plants. Well, yes. How would there be on grass where? Uh huh. Um, I don't know how well. This plant is adapted to salt. Um, I would, if you're looking for a plant that is a little bit more adapted for salt, I would go with woolly thyme instead of uh, this Turkish brown pepper. Yeah, the woolly thyme is, is uh, a really good ground cover. It's a summer bloomer, but uh, so we're not talking about it today, but uh, it's almost as, as bulletproof as turf grass. Yeah. Okay, uh, for those of you who are planting in a shade garden, um, we have some ferns. Um, sorry about this picture, it's not great. Um, it's a really yellow fern, but usually a yellow fern means that it's dead or dying. Uh, that's really not the case in this picture. Like I said, it's just a, a corrupt picture of it. Um, there are some really awesome ferns, um, and you can see some of those here. There's some information about those. You can go anywhere from a really dark green leaf to a lighter green. Um, nice thing about ferns, they don't flower, um, but the leaves are interesting. And in the, in the fall, you can just cut them back down to the ground, they'll come back and be happy. Um, so they'll come up in the, in the later spring and be uh, just a nice foliage plant for the whole season until they fruit. Uh, any guesses on what this one is? It is, it's a bleeding heart. Um, bleeding hearts are, now they can be more of a shrub. They're kind of a taller growing plant, um, but really a really awesome looking flower on these. Um, don't forget to nine, they do prefer shade. You can put them in a little bit of sun, um, and they will bloom April to May. Typically, pink, white, or red flowers. Um, you can get away with giving these flowers, um, these shade flowers, a little bit more water because uh, it's going to retain more well, planting in the shade uh, plants that require a little bit more water because you're not going to be needing to water them as often. So uh, this is the columbine. Um, they're really fun. I think that the, the spurs on the back of the flowers are really quite interesting. Um, and this is kind of a really distinctive flower. Uh, zone three to nine blooms from April to May. Kind of a shorter bloom period, but uh, you can get them that are um, 
multicolored. You can have a, a white inside with the racks being a different color and just really kind of a neat, neat flower. Um, her shape. Uh, you can plant them in full sun. I haven't had a good success with planting them in a full sun application. They tend to do well for a couple of years and then they die out. So I would stick to a more shady play, uh, place for those. Okay, here are a couple of more. So the Vernera. Vernera is uh, another blue flowering, um, shade loving plant. Um, it will spread by seed, and uh, so you can find it in this area over here, and then have another one that was transplanted by seed over in this other area. Um, they they can't spread like that, but um, really a great leaf um, to it. So there's um, some good interest when it's in flower, and then good interest when it's not in flower. It's a good foliage plant. The leaves are really textured and um, fun. Okay, this is probably one of my favorites. This is the hosta. Um, hosta do require a little bit more water, but um, again, they're nice to look at when they're in bloom and also nice to look out when they're not in bloom. Um, a good big leaf to maybe have as a background or as a focal point. Um, some of them uh, have multicolored leaves and are variegated, but others are just a straight green. And they're, they're one of my favorites, especially for the shape. Okay, this is a hookera. Um, a lot of different colors and varieties of, of hookeras. They're uh, also known as coral bells. Um, really interesting leaves. This is one that you will find on the forest floor uh, in in our forest. They typically will grow next to a stream bank, but uh, they are and and the ones that you'll see in the forest they aren't as pretty as it's. They're just going to be a, a typical green, um, but they are other than that, so you're paying attention. Um, so for nine, like I said, it's mainly grown for its leaf um, and the different leaf colors and, and textures. Um, not so much for the flower, but then there are some flowers that um, some varieties that have flowers that do contrast really well with the leaves or complement the, the leaves. So uh, really a fun plant if you're. Um, Wanting some good focal interest. Yes. They do not like it when it gets above like 100 degrees. No, they, they don't enjoy heat. Um, so <clears throat> planting it on the north side of your house or on the east side of your house is probably best. It, so the foliage stays all year. It's yes, the plus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, uh, when it freezes, the, the top of the plant will die, but it will come back for the years in the spring. Um, fertilizing is always a good idea. Um, I would recommend putting down about two pounds of fertilizer um, per thousand square feet in your annual and your perennial beds. Um, sorry, that's two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Use a, a good balanced fertilizer, so like a garden bucket fertilizer, and you want it to be a quick release fertilizer also. So. Something like a, an art fertilizer that's like 16, 15 to 8 is a good balance for your spring frame. Um, you want to go through and, and clean up any of the last year's plant that may still, you may have missed in the, in the fall. Um, stay on top of your leaves, apply a pre emergent. Um, if you have uh, areas around your plants that are bare soil, maybe consider. Putting down some bark mulch or uh, something to help retain your water, but also to keep your plants or sorry, your weeds down. Um, so spring is uh, a really great time to plant your plants. Uh, it's probably the, the second best time. Fall would be preferable. But the nice thing about spring is 
the availability of plants is higher in the spring than it is in the fall. In the fall, your nurseries are trying to clear out, uh, so you can get a really good deal on plants that you want that you, you can find, but the, you're kind of taking a gamble on finding those plants. Um, also, when you're starting up in the spring, make sure that your your irrigation system is is working. Okay. Um, we have some tips on summer maintenance. We'll talk about that in in our other class, and then again fall maintenance. We'll talk about that in our, our other class. But to close today, this is the final thought: It's please think spring. It, it is uh, that's that's really kind of the message of today is is to think about what you want uh, in your yard, uh, especially for the spring. Um, it's been a really long winter and it's not over yet. Um, but um, I just wanted to leave you with this and tell you to, to think spring.